Thank you. Okay, we are going to move on to the next item on our agenda, which is um, the challenges of managing opioids. So we're going to continue our focus on healthcare um, for the next session. Ultimately, we'd all like to find solutions to reduce inappropriate use of this addictive class of medications, but we'll need to find ways to collaborate with the healthcare community to achieve that outcome. Dr. Richard Sun, the chief of our clinical program and appeals section, is here today to lead us in the discussion with Dr. Donison and our guest from Kaiser, Samir Asari. Welcome to all of you, and please start when you're ready. Good morning. Opioids is a severe problem, as you know. It seems to be in the news media every day. Yesterday, a study was published saying that approximately 14% of children who are prescribed opioids are prescribed those inappropriately. Today, we're happy to have with us Dr. Samir As Asare from Kaiser and uh, Dr. Kathleen Donison, who's chief of the Health Plan Administration Division, to give their perspectives on what health plans and employers are doing to control the opioid epidemic. We'll start with Dr. Asare, and then uh, Dr. Donison, and then Dr. Asare again will uh, close the presentation. Well, thank you, Dr. Sun. Uh, we're gonna cover a few areas. One is give you a brief background on the cause of the opioid crisis and the impact on CalPERS and on employers, and I know you see this in the news every single day and then share a little bit of perspective on what CalPERS and KP re recommend about managing the crisis, and then look at some strategies that employers and CalPERS can utilize to manage opioids in the populations that uh, we have in our membership. So the impact on the United States is tremendous. Uh, as this meeting goes on, every 19 minutes, somebody's gonna die from an opioid uh, overdose, and that's, that's just shocking. Uh, 183,000 deaths from opioid-related overdoses from 1999 to 2015. Uh, obviously, lots of uh, admissions to the hospitals and uh, many visits to the emergency room. Take a look at that last bullet, 12 million non-medical users. What does that mean? Uh, when people prescribe opioids to folks, they take it, put it in their medicine cabinet somewhere, and somebody else then gets hold of that. So these are people who are not prescribed the opioids, but are getting them from our friends and our families uh, in our houses. And you see this every single day, uh, yet another celebrity uh, dies from overdose. And, and often it's not just opioids, but it's uh, benzodiazepines and sleeping pills and muscle relaxants. Michael Jackson had all of those things in his uh, bloodstream, so uh, again, uh, a big crisis for our country. And so you might say, well, how the heck did this happen? Uh, one out of three people in America have chronic pain, including myself. I have no cartilage in one of my knees, so it hurts. Uh, and at one point, the pharmaceutical industry actually leveraged two small studies that showed that opioids work for pain and actually translated it from cancer pain to almost any kind of pain. And they funded a lot of the education that I got 10 or 14 years ago, uh, treating pain at any cost. We had to look at these smiley faces, and they said, nothing will happen, no, will, no one will get addicted, and no one will die. And today, of course, we know that it's not really true. And so once people have gotten on these medications, it's really difficult for them to get off it. And there's some new data today that saying even 5% of people who take these kinds of medicines just for three days, so you show up in the ER and you've injured your thumb and you get tablets for three days, could end up on these drugs uh, several years later. And there is something that we always talk about, it's called the 90-day cliff, so when people take these kinds of medicines for 90 days in a row, the chance is 60% of these people will be probably taking them forever. So again, uh, these drugs are highly addictive, and even short usage can turn people into long-term users. So I'm going to hand it over to Kathy to talk a little bit about different sorts of opioid uh, painkillers that are available. I 
wanted to start with the heat map of uh, California, and this is data presented by the Department of Public Health related to opiate prescribing in each county in California. The red and dark, or dark orange areas are those areas with high rates of opiate prescribing by county. You can see that the northern region is, is, um, is one of the areas where a lot of prescribing is going on. The CalPERS team decided to look at opiate prescriptions based on CalPERS data for 2016. And you can see from our heat map that it, it very closely looks like the heat map of California put out by the Department of Public Health. The salmon and orange areas are the counties where we're getting pretty, pretty high prescribing in terms of opioids. And actually, we have begun dialogue with the Department of Public Health to see if we can pool our resources and start to look at why those areas are showing up the way they are. We first identified problems with opioids back in 2004 when we built our data warehouse. And oxycodone, which is a morphine derivative similar to OxyContin, which we'll talk about later, it started showing up in terms of our top five high cost uh, drugs and prescribing for all of our HMOs, Kaiser included, our PPOs as well. And we looked at the basic health plan data at the time uh, between 2005 and 2007. Neither CalPERS nor our health plans could understand why oxycodone or oxycontin was showing up in the top uh, five drugs on our most expensive drugs list. In 2009, we conducted a population health study using 2008 data, and we looked at certain population health issues by California region, our regions. Osteoarthritis and oxycodone, which you see in this chart here, showed up in the north to be 16% higher than the CalPERS average cost per episode. At the time, the CalPERS average oxycodone cost was $10.50 a day compared to the other opiate, opioids, which averaged $2.50 a day. The other northern region at this time had both the high numbers of prescribing and higher cost for oxycodone. Over the, uh, between 2012 and 2015, when we, when we um, added uh, uh, CVS as our PBM, we started looking at the use of OxyContin and the high cost associated with it. You can see from this chart that 2012 and 2013, it was still in the top five. And we actually started implementing utilization management and other formulary controls on how prescribing of opiates was occurring. In 2015, CalPERS spent over $14 million on, uh, on OxyContin, and that is now down to $10 million, but it's still a high cost of our spend. And we also noticed at this time, not only were we dealing with OxyContin as an addictive substance, but we actually, when we converted from Medco to CVS as our PBM, we had to implement pharmacy weaning programs. That is, the physicians, the patient's physician, and uh, the CVS physicians running the weaning program had to work together to really look at the high use of fentanyl and anesthetic, Actique, which is another form of fentanyl, Oxycontin, Vicodin, and other morphine equivalents. So this was a lot of work we did between 2012 and 2016 to try to curb the use of prescribing of opiates. In 2000, as you can see from this slide, in 2016, it's no longer in the top 10, but that does not mean it's still not an expensive drug. In 2017, we changed from uh, CVS to OptumRx, and we continued um, aggressive utilization management programs and made them stronger. For example, in 2017, we implemented short-acting opioid quantity limits. We also limited duration, and we limited numbers of days, or numbers of prescriptions within a 60-day time frame. In 2018, we, we have implemented long-acting 
at long-acting opioid uh, enhanced member outreach and utilization management. These show you the results of our efforts between 2013 and 2017, and you can see that we indeed um, had the numbers of scripts going down, as of course did the cost going down. But if you look at the Medicare population, um, it is tending to rise, and we think some of that is related to members getting these prescriptions and aging into Medicare. And Medicare has its own rules about how to manage opioids. As part of our own ongoing efforts in looking at how opioids are used for low back pain, we looked at our own 2016 data to see, and we've had many conversations about treatments for low back pain, and are opiates really appropriate? And you can see from this chart that uh, OxyContin is still the highest spending amount among these other opioids. And I want you to look at the bottom set of drugs on this chart. They include not only OxyContin, hydrocodone acetaminophen, morphine sulfate, fentanyl, and a new drug of synthetic called Nucenta. And so we do not know yet, but we'll continue to explore, are these uh, patients with chronic conditions that require this level of opiate prescri opioid prescribing, such as cancer? So this is just a start. Um, we actually want to do more work in, in low back pain and alternative therapies. But I would caution our board and our membership to realize that um, pain management is appropriate, and these are, are appropriate in patients with uh, chronic conditions that are comorbidities to cancer or other um, severe conditions with do which Dr. Oswear can speak to. It is the Smart Care California Coalition between CalPERS, Covered California, and Medi-Cal which led us to actually look at opioids again, even though we've spent several years looking at opioids. And our current efforts with Smart Care California is to look at the use, to can further continue looking at the use of opioids in the treatment of low back pain and actually looking for alternative therapies. In our 2019 contracts, we have included performance measures for all of our health plans for opioid dosing and duration. Um, we are working on new measures that we can include in, or measure or evaluate in terms of alternatives to opioid therapy, such as exercise and physical therapy. I'd now I'd like to turn it back to Dr. Oswer, and he will continue our presentation. So I want to share with you uh, one delivery systems uh, approach to the management of opioids. And, we really took a no-blame approach. We uh, really didn't want to say, oh, that bad patient, drug-abusing patient, or, or that bad doctor, the pill mill guy who's just writing a bunch of prescriptions. Yeah, you see those stories that somebody sitting at Starbucks and writing you know, 400 prescriptions and making that money. And we never actually said it's never OK to prescribe opioids. It, it, there are actually appropriate indications for opioids. And if you're going to prescribe them, do it for the appropriate indication. Make sure that you actually monitor the patient like the California Medical Board tells you to do that and do so in a safe way so that you don't actually cause them some harm. So that really was uh, the approach. And, and we have four pillars to that. Uh, one is patient education. The other one is physician education and support. The third one was actually patient safety. And then finally, community protection. So let me talk about uh, all of these as well. We really needed to invest a lot in physician education because uh, I'm a primary care physician and many of us have had patients who had that car accident in 1976. They've seen 10 doctors and their shoulder still hurts. They've been getting opioids and they've been getting benzodiazepines and suddenly I have to now tell them, boy, this could be dangerous for you and they're gonna look at me like, what's wrong with you? Uh, I've been getting this stuff for 20 years and I'm just fine. And so we really took an approach to see, well, who was prescribing these medications? And it was actually my specialty, internal medicine and family medicine, were the highest prescribers in Kaiser Permanente, followed by the emergency room, and then followed by orthopedics, which does all of the joint replacements uh, that you were pointing out on the Medicare members. 
And uh, we actually invited each of these specialties to figure out what sort of uh, education and support that they would need. So the internists, like me, said, we need six hours of education, including two hours of how to talk to patients, because like the patient I mentioned to you, I really do need to be able to talk to them and have a conversation with them. Uh, the emergency room doctor said, well, we're never in the room at the same time. We're all in funny shifts. Uh, we'll do a one-hour education, and we'll do two hours online. And then the orthopedist said, well, we need less than 45 minutes, so just make us the shortest thing you can give us. But the good news is we actually did not make any of this mandatory, and over 99% of our docs uh, did this uh, education, along with uh, collaborations from our pharmacists, physician education, patient education, pain specialists, uh, et cetera. So having that education is not enough. Uh, because when I went to medical school, no one actually taught me about how to take care of these patients. Uh, fortunately for us, we have an electronic medical record that can prompt you. So if you have a patient who has chronic uh, pain and is going to go on opioids, it actually asks you the questions the CDC and the California Medical Board tells you to ask. See if they're at risk, higher risk for addiction. Are you actually monitoring them? Are you seeing the patient? And lo and behold, we actually now have a monthly report that goes out to every physician which tells them of all their patients who are on these opioids. And I had never seen a report before. So it's pretty eye-opening to say, wow, I have these patients who are taking opioids. Have I seen this patient in the last year? Are they taking other medications that could be harmful to them? And, and that actually has allowed our physicians to then uh, work on these lists. And it's pretty hard when patients have been on these for 10, 15, 20 years to suddenly try to taper them off. And fortunately in our system, we have some chronic pain pharmacists who are able to help our physicians taper some of our patients down. So again, a great collaboration, educating our physicians, giving them the data, and then supporting them to do the right thing. Whoops, it actually went a little out of order. Oops, oh, there it is, okay. So the other area we wanted to work on is really patient education and giving true informed consent. I mean, it's a lot easier to just write a script and get someone out of your exam room in your office. You really do need to have a conversation when you're prescribing a medication like this, especially when I showed you the data, even taking it for three days, you're likely to get addicted. So again, making sure that our patients have uh, whatever uh, method they like. So whether they come in person and understand about these opioids, have a class, they can go online and actually do something called an Emmy, and they can actually do this before they come out. And then we have something called a opioid treatment agreement. So people who agree to go on this for long term do understand the risks and benefits. And it's very interesting. When people go through the education process, we've had over 20% of our patients who say, I don't want to take this stuff. Get me off this stuff. So it's not like everybody's just going after this and trying to get addicted. Uh, people, once they're educated, really do not want to be on these medications if they're not indicated. So I'm going to go backwards here for a second. OK, so community protection is really important. And Kathy, you brought this up. And you're wondering why the OxyContin was going up. It's, it really has a lot of street value because it works really fast, it's very potent, and it can be abused, and you can break it up and sniff it and do all kinds of things with it. And that's why OxyContin really was one of the highest uh, prescribed drugs because it had street value. And similarly, Vicodin, which had a V and the Norco had an N on it, when we went to a generic, all of a sudden people didn't want it. And that told us that these are people who are probably not using it for their pain and were probably diverting this somewhere else. The other thing we decided to do is to just give the right amount. So if I came to the emergency room and I'd injure my arm, and the ER doctor thinks that it's gonna hurt for three days, well, good, give me 10 tablets. Don't write me a prescription for 200 Percocet or 100 Vicodin. Just give the right amount. And then the other uh, thing I mentioned to you on that other slide was the 12 million non-medical users. Today when somebody breaks into your house, they don't go for your iPad, they actually go into your bathroom and open the medicine cabinet. And they're looking for OxyContin or something like that. So again, giving patients an opportunity to return these medications if they have not used them. 
I work at our Santa Clara Medical Center, and we had one of these days to take back stuff. We had 600 pounds of opioids that people came and returned. And today, all of our pharmacies and many pharmacies in the community, fire stations, police stations, are not able to take this stuff back. And that is really something that we need to communicate with our patients. Once you're done taking this, don't put it in your cabinet. Your grandkids could get hold of it. Someone else might get it. Bring it, dispose it, and hopefully we give them the right amount so they don't have hundreds of pills. The other thing you need to do is something called urine drug screens. And each of us can get fooled. I had a patient who was 60-some-year-old. Uh, I've had him for a long time. He has osteoarthritis of his knees. He has ulcer disease, so he can't take Motrin. And he was only taking two Vicodin a day, and he'd been doing that for 20-some years. And so now we're educating our doctors to say, hey, do a urine drug screen. And I'm like, this person doesn't need one. But if I'm teaching this, then I should do this as well. So I did one. Turns out he had no hydrocodone in his urine, which is really interesting. So I said to him, I said, hmm, your urine drug screen is negative. What are you doing with this medication? And he actually said, you know, doc, times are really tough, and I'm actually selling it. And I'm like, wow, I would have never thought that this person, who I've had forever and ever, a nice grandpa, would be actually selling it. We had to help, help him with social services, finding him food, and all of these other things. And of course, we stopped his Vicodin. The other thing we've done is to really work with our community partners, and you showed that smart care in the California Healthcare Foundation. That's been great, because if one healthcare system is making a change, all you have to do is go down to the emergency room down the hall, I mean down the next exit in Santa Clara County, we have 17 hospitals. So if the two KP hospitals are doing something, then all of the other hospitals need to do the same thing. So at least in Santa Clara County, Contra Costa, Alameda, we're starting some collaborations with the emergency room so that the messaging is very consistent and that we're doing the same kind of thing. So if people are seeing someone for acute pain, give them a small amount, treat them, and send them back to their own primary care doctor who's taking care of it. So community protection is really, really important. And then I think, uh, Kathy, you brought this up as well. Uh, opioids should not be the very first thing you think of when somebody's having pain. There's all sorts of alternatives and People need to have easy access to that. So health plans need to make that available to members. So things like physical therapy, Tai Chi, mindfulness, cognitive behavioral therapy, acupuncture, other medications that are non-opioids. There are plenty of different things that patients need to get and need to get easily because when they can't get that, somebody actually writes them a prescription for opioids and that's not the right thing to do. And then, uh, again, we talked about this a little bit, prescribing uh, smaller quantities, and then paying attention to what else they're taking. And you pointed this out as well. CalPERS has got an initiative to look at benzodiazepines and opioids. These are the sleeping pills taken with opioids really increases the chance of bad things happening, people dying. And then having naloxone, which is a medicine that uh, kind of uh, turns back uh, the bad effects of opioids if you're overdosing and making that easily available. That's actually now available in the state without a prescription. So getting people this medicine and actually the family member because the patient could be in trouble and the family member might have to administer that is really something that we need to work on. And you brought up fentanyl. I think the CDC just put out an alert today on carfentanil, which is a much more potent one and it's been coming here from outside the country and often it takes two and three injections of uh, naloxone to actually get that patient to turn around. Very, very dangerous uh, medication that's out on the street. The other thing that I wanted to briefly talk about is uh, enhanced recovery after surgery. And this is something our orthopedic colleagues have been working on. Because when I first asked them, so why do you write these prescriptions? And it really turned out where they were trained. So if they went to UCSF, it was just in the orders that they learned 10 years ago, 200 Percocet. Maybe I went to USC, I wrote 100 uh, Vicodin. And I finally said to them, do you ever see these patients again? They said, of course I do. I see them in one, two, one week to 10 days. I said, could we agree on just giving them one week to 10 days of medicine? Because then you can look at them and see if they are better and need any more. And actually, they worked on something called enhanced recovery after surgery, which is different things. They can actually inject medications into the patient's joint, 
which then does not require them to take high doses of opioids. So this definitely has been a successful strategy for us. And I think we did that. So here's what we saw over the last uh, four years, four or five years is actually a 40% decrease in the opioids prescribed. So you definitely see that in the CalPERS. Uh, and actually that map of California you showed, uh, it actually mirrors the areas where Kaiser Permanente is in because Southern California Kaiser Permanente has had similar results. So if you look at all the counties where KP is, the numbers are actually low. If you look at the counties where KP is not present, we look like Vermont and North Carolina and all of those countries. The numbers are pretty high, so we really do have to educate our colleagues in counties where uh, big delivery systems are not available. And so you might say, well, why, did, why was this successful? I think it was successful because we had strong leadership support from every level, from the top in Oakland, to our 20 medical centers, to our almost 53 offices all across Northern California. Everybody gave a clear and consistent message. We actually got the prescribers involved in their own education. And when they were educated, we had local people teaching them. So I work at Campbell, and having somebody teach that to me from my colleagues was actually much more powerful than Oakland sending me a memo or something strange like that. Uh, educating our patients and helping us communicate with each other was really important. And then that physician-specific data, if I'd never seen the data to say, here's your patients who are on opioids. Do they still need to be on opioids? They're on these other medications. Are they getting naloxone? Are we treating them safely? And then finally, having some colleagues to help us. Sometimes you have a tough case, and, and somebody's put this patient on headache, uh, on opioids, and that's really not the right thing to do. I need my colleague from neurology or pain services to help me with this patient. And having that and my pharmacy colleagues to help me taper when appropriate really were the successful strategies. So I think it takes a, will a village. I mean, not only the healthcare system, the physicians, the patients, we have law enforcement here on the side here. And, and our colleagues in dentistry, actually today one of our highest prescribers are other. The category says other, and it's actually our dentists. And I had a chance to talk with Assemblyman Wood, who is a dentist in the California Dental Association, to say, how are we going to work on this issue at, while, while the medical community is working on it? And then again, the work that CalPERS has done has been really tremendous. Uh, there have not been really good national guidelines on how to evaluate things. CMS has put some stuff out, but I think your Smart Care Forum has had some really good ideas that the rest of the country can take a look at that. So with that, I think we really want to save some time for questions because I think there will be a lot. <laughs> I'd like to thank our presenters, and now we'll pass the microphone back to the board for questions and comments. Thanks very much. Any questions? Oh, Teresa, Ms. Taylor. Nobody's asking questions, so I thought it'd help. <laughs> I want to thank you guys for the presentation. It was very good. It was very um, good to see the decline. I'm very impressed with that. It's a difficult situation you find yourselves in. I just heard from a friend of mine who went to the uh, her legislators meeting, um, which was Ami Berra, and that, uh, one of the big complaints was that the the people in the community felt like legislation is trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but it looks like that's not what Kaiser and, and CalPERS is doing, so it's good to see that. Um, we were both looking at benzodiazepine, and that is used as a sleep medication in addition to the nar narcotic. I'll address, finish yeah. here, okay. So, so I think you, you bring up some really good concerns. One is we, one out of three people have chronic pain, so we need to help people to deal with their pain and, and to give them the appropriate kinds of treatments when available. So yes, it's probably not a good idea for the legislature to tell us how to practice medicine. <laughs> and I have to say there have been at least 12 local bills and at least yeah, uh, there were a few here. Senate bills. Congress, I mean, all last three months, that's all I've been doing is writing back to yeah. these folks to say, yes, we know there's a crisis, but uh, we really do need to address it in a different way rather than just saying, no, you can't have any more pills. There was one proposal that said you can't have more than five days of tablets. So 
I could have a patient who's had both their three knees days. replaced. Three well, days. there's one for three days yeah. too. And, and if they can't even get in a car and drive to a pharmacy, I think we have to be thoughtful about those kinds of things and really customize it. The other issue you brought up is benzodiazepines. So you know these things. This is Valium, Librium, Ativan, Xanax, okay, okay. all of these pills that we use for sleep. And Zolpidem, actually, Ambien, uh, another bad combination, wasn't in here. The other uh, combination, it's called the Holy Trinity, the muscle relaxants, so the Soma and the Flexeril, uh, not good. This Holy Trinity actually gets you to God faster than you want, so don't, don't want that. <laughs> is that why you call it that? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think, I think one of the things is my, I suffer from chronic pain, from back pain. Yeah. I'm, I'm, one of the things that I'm trying to do is go in, I have a uh, cortisone epidural shot coming up yeah. Thursday. Yeah. Well, they took me off my Motrin for three days and now I'm dying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I see where people can get addicted. I see where Absolutely. it... Absolutely. Because you're always in pain. So, it, to, so one of the things I think I, I, the question I have then is you're not saying people who have chronic pain can't have it. You just have to monitor them more closely than you used to. Or, or they may benefit from other kinds of things. So what happens in chronic pain is that pain is always knowing in there and it actually creates some new pathways in the brain. So we respond in a very different way when you, so many hurts and when it hurts it triggers some different response that we would not have if it was a one-time thing. If it's a chronic thing that pathway actually forms and it creates something in the brain that uh, makes us respond that way. So we have to actually retrain ourselves. So the pain's not gonna go away, but I have to learn how to deal with it and live with it. And in occasional cases, opioids may be the right thing to do. But for low back pain, absolutely not. There's so many other uh, options. And giving people fentanyl is, is just scary. That's, that's actually gonna kill them. And, and we really monitor that. So last year, we gave zero prescriptions in Northern and Southern California for fentanyl for someone who had not seen opioids. Very, very dangerous. So. And, and is, isn't it true, too, that um, if you're on opioids, it can actually perpetuate the pain? So the pain might not dissipate as quickly as it might have if you weren't on opioids. That's right. So, so the opioids actually cause something called hyperalgesia. So the pain response is different, and it, it over time, will develop some tolerance and dependence and, and then kind of gets you into trouble. So getting off the opioid, your pain would actually feel better. So is there any recommendations that you have for us? I mean, obviously, we've already uh, done a lot within our program and within the benefit design and the contracts, but uh, is there anything else that you think we could be doing or adding to our toolbox here to help mitigate this, this very alarming issue? You know, I, th I think you guys have been doing a great job, especially the Smart Care, the California Healthcare Foundation. I did go to that meeting, had leaders in opioids from every single program. I mean, us, Sutter, the county hospitals, Everyone was engaged. Uh, so continuing to keep the spotlight in this area, getting people to pay some attention, and then we gotta figure out all those counties that are in red and hot pink and orange. On No, th those are still our patients, and, and how do we go out to those rural areas? That's actually something uh, Congressman Thompson and Senator Wood said to me. The, it's great for you to be here in the Bay Area and KP to do all these things, but I have other constituents who are suffering and how are we going to help in those particular areas and I don't, I don't know that we figured that out yet so, so I don't know do you have a thought so that is that's exactly what I wanted to tell you about what some of our next steps are and, it, and it's actually we got put together with Department of Public Health through our Smart Care California um, coalition and we will be meeting, um, I believe it's next week, with Dr. Wirtz from the California Department of Public Health and his team to see if we can start to look at those hot spots in Northern California and in some of the eastern part of the state to look at how do we identify what's going on with this prescribing, and starting with the prescribers, not necessarily the patients. And so we're, we're pretty excited about forging forging a path to do that. And the other is, and I didn't mention it, but I do want to do so now, we also have now strategic measures on dose and duration. We are gonna be working on a low back pain and, an, and how to measure alternative therapies, or how to set them up and then measure them, and that's gonna be part of the afternoon discussion. Great. 
Thank you. I'm oh, sorry, did you have something? No, I was just going to say the alternative therapies is really important. So if you don't have the right resources in place, right, the patients still have pain. If we don't have anything else for their pain, you can't just take away the opioid and say, sorry, because now they're going to go to take heroin or something else and get, you know, hepatitis C or HIV. So we don't want to do that. And same thing with the physicians. If there's no education for them, no other resources to help them taper these patients or work with them, uh, it's pretty hard. As a primary care physician, if I had two or three patients to taper in a year, that's about all I can handle. Uh, if I had 20 or 30, not happening unless someone's going to help me. Yeah. So I think that's what we have to look at. Thank you. Mr. Fechner. Yeah, thank you, Madam President. Uh, you know, I think that not only is going to the providers first, like you said, Ms. Donison, and educating them, but we have to find a way to do a better job as a society in educating the patients because it gets to the point where the provider actually catches on and says, you know, you don't need this anymore. You've been taking too much and taking you off. But I know people, in fact, one that I know quite well, they were taken off of the drugs, and now they go to Mexico to buy their Soma because it's the doctor's fault that they're not getting their pills. Not that they don't need it or it's bad for them overall. So we need to find a better way to educate the, the consumer as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Miller? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, just a couple observations and, and, and encouragement. I, I've seen this go from um, the situation where we weren't really getting close to root causes. And I'm, I'm really encouraged that we're getting closer to those last couple why and why to, to really get to root causes to be able to have more systematic and systemic kinds of solutions and, and approaches. And I've even seen just in the last few years the change from uh, members feeling like they're being um, just handed opioids to then the pendulum swung back and people felt like geez, I'm being accused of being a malingerer and a drug seeker and my doctor is Sounds like a police detective, and, and then it's really hard to get my stuff filled, and if I get a little off kilter, I can't get it on the weekend, and it's just a mess. To, and the, the, just the spike in the need for these code gray incidents and everything when someone just cannot handle the news that suddenly they're, they feel like they're being sent away to go be in pain. And that has improved so much. Um, over the last few years, and so I just want to um, acknowledge that and appreciate that and hope that we can continue on to get further into the root causes and be more systematic so that our members who really do need um, some of these medications where there really is not yet a practical clinical alternative that will work for them and uh, you know, to see that they can get that without feeling like uh, they're being unduly pressured or, or uh, in some cases, feel like they're being accused of things. So uh, thanks very much for the presentation. It's very encouraging. Yeah, I think you bring up an important point. We don't want to create a new stigma to people taking this stuff. And our division of research is actually interviewing a whole bunch of patients who've come off opioids to say, how was that experience? How could we have done it better? Uh, and not make you feel bad. I mean, once they're all off it, they all feel great, but they have told us a lot of uh, tips on how we could have done it better. Thank you. I, I, is I there had one Ms. more Taylor. thing that yes. I forgot. Mm -hmm. I had, um, I was at a presentation um, at the Harvard Trustee Leadership Forum, and they were, one of the presentations was about actually holding the pharmaceutical companies responsible for this crisis. And I guess because um, the particular person doing the presentation, it was their members that were becoming, had become highly addicted to this. They, they um, you know, whether it was an injury or whatever. Um, and um, is there any response? I know we're trying to look at a solution, right? But I think there's a, a responsibility from, from that perspective that, um, they sold it to doctors like you and patients like us as 
the great thing that we needed to do. It was low cost. It was it helped us. Is there any sort of uh, anybody looking at that? Any uh, you know response to the pharmaceutical companies? Yeah, so there is actually a statewide and a national effort looking into that, and guess what? There's a whole bunch of class action suits that are currently out there, just like the tobacco stuff. Uh, you can, I mean, I'm a little bit biased on this one, but you can look at the list of billionaires on the Forbes list, and the Sackler family makes it on there, and th these are the guys, Purdue Pharmaceuticals, with OxyContin, which uh, they definitely have made a ton of money. So, not a lawyer, but I know what's what, what I'm reading in the news is a lot of class action lawsuits coming up. And I believe there have been some local jurisdictions, counties who have start who have sued because of the public health costs associated with this problem. Well, uh, with that, I want to really thank you, um, Richard and Kathy and and Dr. Asser, for that truly thought-provoking and, and somewhat hopeful <laughs> session. Um, next up, we're going to revisit the healthcare market analysis that we began in January. As you know, there are several health plans that modified their coverage zones during this year's health negotiations. So where do we go from here? How will we continue to provide our members with high-quality care in the regions where they live while also um, trying to hold down the costs? So Sherry Little is going to lead that discussion. Our, she's our Chief of Health Policy 